Father, we love your name. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that uh, the welcome of the church that you've offered the world has turned into a true belonging for all who are washed in the blood. God, as we let the root of the faith of Christ continue to do its work in our lives, we uh, submit to your word. Before we read it, we say we trust it. Um, we ask for a renewed hunger and desire for what you have to say and that you would find in us a willing place, a willing heart to deposit these heavenly divine counsel and truths. Um, we pray, Father, that it would produce in us a, a biblical life and also a, a, a glory uh, through works for you and for your name. So bless us, we pray, as we crack open the ancient word of God to receive treasure. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen. James 5. 7 through 12. May the Father add his blessing to the reading and the hearing and the understanding of his word. Be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against each other, brothers, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, Take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we consider blessed are those who, are, who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Above all, my brothers, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. Let your yes be yes and your no, no or you will be condemned. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right. As we break this down, I'm going to make sure you get handouts. Um, as we break this down, we start off with the concept of being patient. James doesn't let off at all. There's not a single section of James where you can take a breath. So that's why we're doing this in slow chunks. Last week it was about wealth. This week is about patience. They, they say, you know, be sure you're careful about what you pray for. Uh, if you pray for patience, God may give you patience through a trying of your faith. He may give you a chihuahua to take care of or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do you? Or you'll suddenly be volunteered to take care of the nursery on Sunday. So, he says, be patient then, my brothers, until. Be pray, patient, my brothers, until. Um, and so, let's, let's break down. We'll go further into the, the why, but the, com the command is to be patient until. That definitely, clearly means it's a temporary patience. Um, having great bursts of effort... Only work if it's temporary. Um, the good news of any of the difficulties we're called to persevere through is that it's an until. This is not your life. This is not forever. This is, this is going to be part of your short, short life on earth, but it will end. And so I like to use the word temporarily patient because that frames it biblically. Um, so there's two things. I should have written a, a two before the second part. But number one, our heavenly character, not our natural man, but our, our regenerated person, uh, is actually intolerant. Uh, never settling, requiring nothing less than the Lord himself to be satisfied. As Paul says, to die is gain. Your heavenly character, we're talking about your character. Um, 
over time as it airs out, you find that you don't find joy in the things you once found joy in. Don't worry. You're not depressed. This is the work of God. God removes slowly but surely the joy of lesser things that you once held and begins to create a hunger in you that can only be satisfied in the man Jesus Christ. Um, who is more excited about Jesus returning this afternoon at 3 p.m.? The people that are well-fed, happy, and satisfied by everything the world has to offer? Or the man in a POW camp that has been there for seven years? When God weans us off of the false comforts of this world, that's a good thing. That's a gift. One of the developments you'll find when God is moving you through a personalized boot camp is that you don't find joy in the things you once found joy in. And you, you'll, you, your former self wouldn't believe you if you said this. But he would, your new self can say to your old self, Old self, you don't realize that your problem isn't that you want stuff too much. It's that you're too easily satisfied. You're ruining your appetite on chips and salsa when enchiladas are coming. You don't... You stop. Stop. So... All right, what was it? I want to hear the joke. I want to hear the joke. He's back there eating Doritos. Crunch away, good sir. Just don't lick your fingers. So, uh, just remember, it's also similar in, um, if you turn with me real quick to Romans 2, verse 4. If you've got it, say, I got it. If you don't, say, hold up. Got it? All right. Okay. Or do you show contempt for the riches of God's kindness and tolerance and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is to lead you toward repentance? What you see here is evidence that, look at God, just the character of God. God by character is not tolerant at all. That's not his character. That's his strategy. We see it, in, we see it uh, throughout the scriptures that there's a call to be patient, which has got to be said because it actually goes, it's not natural to our, even our regenerated character. The character, we can flip back to James, the character of a, of a Christian is a person that says, I hate... My sin. I abhor wickedness. These are biblical words. I've heard it multiple times preached that hate is not part of the Christian language. Yes, it is. Uh, the, the first 15 Psalms contain seven explicit statements of God saying, I hate wickedness. I have no tolerance for sin. That's why Jesus had to become a curse. God didn't tolerate our sin. He paid for it. He dealt with it. When God forgives something or does something, it's not He, he neglects it or sweeps it under the rug. He, he takes what He hates and He pays for it and He owns it Himself and He, he casts it into outer darkness. So the, the character you'll find bubbling up in your, inside of you is over time an actual lack of tolerance in your character, a lack, of, a lack of desire in lesser things, and the only thing you want is Jesus. That's our, that's our heavenly character. Um, and the reason I can say that is because when we're in heaven, there will be no need for patience. There will be no need for tolerance. 
There will be no opinions. It won't be the, I've said before, the democratic process does not produce truth, it produces popularity. And we will joyfully submit to a king. It's a hard image for an American to understand. We will bend the knee. We will sing hymns like we sing today. Come and reign over us. So uh, that's the character God's bringing out in His holy church is, is to um, settle for nothing less than the perfect reign and rule of God over us and over the world. Now, what we're commissioned to do is our, I call it our temporary striving, calling, or strategy. And I like the word temporary. It's kind of like house guests. After three days, it's the, it's the body rule. A dead body starts to stink after three days. So, um, I don't care who you are, I love you, but please let me know this is temporary. I'll be a better host if it's temporary. Uh, I misspelled temporary, so you'll have to get over that. So it should be number two. Our temporary striving, calling, and strategy is to temporarily tolerate intolerable things for a greater gain. To temporarily tolerate intolerable things for a greater gain. For that's what God does for us. He makes room for us. Uh, so I've written, patience is not condoning. It is a power to induce change and opportunities to others as Christ has done for us. Romans 2.4 The tolerance of God, again, is not His character. It's a, cho it's a choice He's made. It's not God's character to kill His Son. He doesn't go around wanting to kill His Son. That's a good example. He chose to kill His Son on a cross for a greater gain. Not because he likes to do it, but because he likes what it can produce. And um, so, as God has executed tolerance um, to us, we also are called to execute a same sense of heavenly, holy tolerance. Another way to look at it is a, almost a seesaw, uh, in, uh, inverse proportioned relationship between God's tolerance and God's righteousness. When the lights are turned down, when God's glory and righteousness are concealed, His tolerance is high. Think, think Egypt. When the hand and glory of God was shown, His tolerance was gone. Think Sodom and Gomorrah. Think the book of Revelation. The end of time, God turns on the lights. Everyone prays for the Holy Spirit, but do we not know that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth and exposure? Are you ready for that? Are you ready for everyone to see your internet search history? The secret thoughts of your heart? I know how wicked I am. If I had, if I had a recording device to be able to take a... a some pictorial film of my heart from the, day I, from the time I got here this morning until this, this hour. And it recorded all of my secret thoughts. And then on this screen, we played it. I would run out of here and never come back. <laughs> you see? Sinner that I am, God tolerates for a greater gain. He's re removing the wheat from the chaff. He's, he's healing us. He's credited us as righteousness, even though as righteous, even though we're sinners. So it's, we have to understand this: that as children of God through Christ, we also are beginning to, to have this transformation in our lives, where where we simultaneously want the glory of God, but we fear the glory of God. And that's how we ought to be kind to other people. As God has been kind to us, we need to be kind to other people. I've joked before, don't judge me because I sin differently from you uh, than you. So, um, and let's get one more example of this concept of patience. Again, as a strategy, not as a character trait. Uh, Matthew 18, 21 through 35. This is a parable Jesus tells. <clears throat> a 
Matthew 18, 21 through 35. Uh, <laughs> Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Seven. Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but seventy-seven times. And then he tells his parable, Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And as he began the settlement, a man who owed him ten thousand talents was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had uh, be sold to repay the debt. That's intolerance, right? This is glory. This is, this is what you owe. And just real quick, the reason we pray to the Father in the name of Jesus and not in our own name is because Jesus is the only one that doesn't owe him a thing. We have no leverage with God to pray a single prayer in our own name. The reason we go to God in the name of the Lord Jesus, our mediator and high priest, is because Jesus Christ alone has paid the debt. His and ours, no, not, not even his, our debt. He can stand sinless before, Christ, before the Father. And so all of us, when we go before God in this life and in the life to come, must be covered in the blood of the Lamb Jesus Christ that God has provided. That's the only way it works. Otherwise, our debts remain. But in this case, we have a man who actually has debts. The king shows his glory and says, I'm not going to tolerate you getting away with this. I'm going to say, what is he going to sell? His, family. his whole family. He's going to sell his, this guy's children into slavery. Because that's, what, that's what's owed, right? That's, what's, that's what should happen if we're talking about what's fair. As my dad says, the fair's in Dallas. <laughs> so settle down. But then here's verse 26. The servant fell on his knees before him. What's he say? Be patient, Be patient with me. He begged. And I will repay back everything. And so all he's saying, so first all he's asking is, give me more time. He doesn't say forgive the debt. He says, be patient with me which is plenty to ask for. Then the servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, let him go. This is what it looks like for a sinner to go before God and say, I owe you more than I ever dreamed. Let me begin the pro give me more time. And then God says, ah, this is a sinner who knows how much he owes. This is a sinner who knows that he doesn't have a right. He doesn't have a right to even... To even ask me for this is a mercy. He understands this. And so I'll forgive everything. Now the story goes on, obviously, and there's this servant doesn't act repentantly, does he? He doesn't exercise patience. We can get on to that. But when the servant went out, this same guy found out one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, which is much less. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. Is he very tolerant? No. Pay back what you owe me. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him. What are, what are his words? Be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead he went off and he had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went out and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in, you wicked servant, he said, I canceled all the debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he showed, should pay back all that he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Okay. That parable wraps this strange tension between what's right in terms of justice, uh, no tolerance, pay back the debt. 
versus the power of patience to change people. Um, in this case, we saw that God's patience, the king's patience with the first guy, didn't result in patience for other people. A.K.A. the guy's heart had never changed. He was just glad to have his debts removed. He, hadn't, he wasn't moved by the king to look like the king. He was moved to have his debts removed. And he probably went off and got indebted anyhow anyway. It's like most people do. And he didn't change. And because he didn't change, he wasn't credited. As a regenerate person, he's thrown in what we would call hell to be tortured until every sin is paid for. That's called hell. And so what we have in this parable is a calling to recognize that what happened to us, God has given the ability for us to exercise that to other people. You read, uh, we pray every Sunday the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our... As... Have you ever thought about that? Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Do, you, do we realize what we're saying? This is not saying to God, I'm starting a deal with you of works righteousness, that I'm going to forgive people, and any, only as far as I forgive people, you have the right to forgive me too. We, don't have, we can't bargain with God. That's not how this works. What this prayer is saying is that the power to walk in forgiveness is either part of my life or it ain't. It's a two-way street. I either, I either know that I've been a wretch that's been wiped of my sins and all of my debts have been canceled and therefore I'm able to exercise joy and patience with people who are intolerable but I can do it through Christ. Or I still in the heart of my hearts pray that prayer with my lips but still feel like I'm self-righteous in my own works. And I still go around saying well at least I'm better than that guy. Here's the deal. You're bad compared to Christ. He's the only one who owes no debts to God. Every one of us is bad compared to Christ. And so that's from the Lord's Prayer to Matthew 18 to today's teaching. It's important to understand that what, what we start this passage in is that the scriptures are not telling us um, that our new character ought to always be uh, rejoicing over sin apologizing and condoning evildoers uh, to whitewashing injustices. That's not what this is saying. Instead, it's saying, while you hunger for a complete righteousness and the lights to be turned on, I have called and commissioned you to be a preacher of the Word of God in this world that's going to require you to take time with sinners. Parents, don't be upset when your kids need parenting. Pastors, elders, don't be upset when Christians need growing. Don't uh, Take your thing. The whole point of being commissioned into this world is that we're dealing with broken, sinful, confused, ignorant, blind rebels like us. And so that's where this comes from. So again, this is not, I, I want to get as far away from me saying to you to just pull yourself up by your own bootstraps and become a patient person. No, you're supposed to be a person who only settles for heaven, only settles for Christ, but while your heart's in heaven, you're willing to meet people where they are. And that's a really important lesson because right now in the church in America, we are being strong-armed and arm-twisted and sob-stored into condoning sins. In the book of Isaiah, it said, cursed, is the, cursed are the people who called evil good and good evil, and exchanged light for darkness and darkness for light. This is, the, the point of the Bible is not for us to lower the standard of God and tell everyone they're fine. Jesus Christ did not come down from heaven and descend to tell everyone like a hippie, you're doing great, later. He came that he could remove the sin of the world. That we could be regenerated. And so, those, those tensions have to be held uh, together. And, and let's go on to the, next, to the next part. So, be patient until, so be temporarily patient until something happens. The Lord comes. 
This is a temporary situation. You won't have to be patient forever. See how the farmer waits for the crop to yield its valuable, the land to yield its valuable crop, and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. So I've written um, the farmer waits. Ek dekomai waits is the word, and that's two words put together. Ek means out slash from and to. So think of the father on the prodigal son leaving his porch, leave, leaving his house toward his son, um, plus welcomes. This is the, ex, this is the um, heart condition of the farmer. A true farmer um, is constantly welcoming a crop. As he welcomes a valuable, and the word valuable means in Greek, recognized value in the eyes of the beholder. So he knows... Even if the world doesn't know, he knows that what's going to come out of this ground is priceless. As he welcomes this valuable crop, see how his focus on the crop allows him to wait, work, trust, be gentle, and be strong. If from Christ bearing the cross to us bearing the little crosses, bear, take up your cross, our path for Christ... Whoever you are, whatever you're going through, if, how do I say this? Uh, my, my examples are always distance running, but I get side stitches. I don't know if you get those, but I get those all the time. If all I know about my day, or an ex, if I'm out on a run, and all I, all I think about and anticipate and experience is the side stitch, and not the wind in my face, the good wind, not the West Texas wind. <laughs> and the sunshine on my shoulders and the feeling of breath and the fact that God gave us bodies to move. And see, if I'm, if, and, 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 and that I'm, I, the sh I like to take a shower, a cold shower afterward, and I sleep better that night. And I mean, just you name it. <clears throat> and if all, of, all I think about is how I'm having to endure a side stitch, then you, then you miss the whole point. Um, the reason I'm able to endure a side stitch, the reason you're able to endure it, whatever you're enduring right now, and everybody's enduring something, um, is because you're welcoming something better. And so the farmer is willing to endure time, he's willing to endure labor, everything, because he sees and he's ready to welcome the value of the crop. Now the thing about the farmer is that he's done it before, he did it last year. And so what Paul or what James is doing is saying, Use the farmer as an example because he has, a, he has a faith that farming works. Now his is both because his dad taught him to farm and because he's farmed before, but he has a faith that this works. I'm asking you to have at least that much faith in the Lord returning. He tells us, you too, be patient. Establish your heart and refuse to grumble. Why? He gives us two reasons, and I've written them. Number one is the Lord's coming is near, verse 8. And verse 9, the judge is standing at the door. He writes, You too, be patient, stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near, and don't grumble, or you will be judged, for the judge is standing at the door. Um, I've written a couple things. Number one, the ending is fixed. Jesus will return. Uh, the Lord's coming should strengthen us. That should be a a joy. Um, number two is he will walk in suddenly and he is listening now as the true judge. On your own time, I, we're not going to be able to get into it, but 2 Timothy 4 is a great example of uh, the Lord will return to judge the quick and the dead. And that's the same passage that says that Paul writes to Timothy and says, be Firm in your calling. Persevere, Timothy. Same words. I mean, same concept. For the world is turning away to wickedness. People are going to surround themselves with teachers to, to scratch their itching ears, tell them what they want to hear. I mean, you've heard this message. Um, and he's talking to a preacher that's, that's going through a difficult uh, path. And he's saying, preach the word. Preach the word. And you preach the word because the judge is coming and he can already hear what you're saying. Um, I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you're talking real loud and the music stops and everyone can hear you. Uh, that's, 
what's going to happen, and that's what is happening. And so these two truths mean the reason we should be patient, uh, I've written in bold, be motivated by Jesus' nearness. Anything done in obedience to him is priceless and incomparable to the cost. The, the farmer is motivated by the crop. The church is motivated by the Lord. Um, that's in terms of holiness and perseverance and good works. Whatever your secret sin is, whatever you struggle with through your life, try... Pr- uh, let's say you've got, you've got uh, lust and pride or something in your heart and you're, you're struggling, you know, you've just been struggling for years. And then uh, one day, uh, a, media, a meteor the size of Texas flies across the sky and, and touches, tra- doesn't even hurt, but just touches the earth. You see it happen. That, during that event, do you have any lust in your heart? Your pride? No, you're just overwhelmed by this. You're small, you're an infant compared to this great event. The nearer we are to Jesus, all of our sins are gone. The, the active sins we have, and this is what he's calling us to, is trust not only that the Lord's return is an actual historical event that will, that will take place on the calendar, on, the day, on a real day, but the promise itself should be, should be experienced in advance that he is like the brilliance of the sun in the sky, brighter than 10,000 suns, and you being near that, you can't even think your own thoughts anymore. You're out of your mind, you're out of your, you're out of your own emotions. You have to dance to it till it's done. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so um, that's the, the point is that you're, you're to be patient. That's your calling. Uh, temporarily tolerant. Uh, and your motivation isn't because... You want to be known as a tolerant person or you want people to think a lot about you. Your motivation is that Jesus is near and that in the, in the road, down, down the road, uh, the things done in, obedient to Jesus, in obedience to Jesus and only the things done in obedience to Jesus have any everlasting value. And a lot of those things are going to be done through the path of patience, investing in people. Um, I've written biblical patience necessarily involves suffering. Quick side note, we will suffer for Christ. Um, We don't look for suffering. As we walk the path of nearness to Christ and obedience to Him, any suffering that comes, and it will come, should be received as part of our assignment resulting in more joy. I can't count or rattle off all the scriptures about this. Uh, from the Lord Himself to every epistle, which is, if we're going to have a share in a glory like His, we must also suffer with Him. Take up your cross and follow Me. You must be willing to deny yourself. Um, if you love even your children more than Me, you're not worthy of My kingdom. Uh, you must be willing... I mean, just I didn't come to bring just peace, but a sword. Uh, on and on the, the Scriptures go. Uh, do not start off on this road without counting the cost, or you'll be made fun of like a man who began to build a tower and couldn't finish the walk. Understand, and that's why when we share the gospel with, with people, uh, when, when you hear the gospel or you're sharing it with somebody, it's unfair and it's not cool to withhold this critical truth that somebody, as they're falling in love with Jesus, to say, now you need to understand, you will suffer. Jesus didn't hide that fact at all. Paul starts half of his letters with that. You will suffer. We're not used to that. We don't think about that. But the point is, a lot of times what we'll say is, I have patience as long as it doesn't cost me anything. So, again, we don't go looking to suffer. God does not... uh, Us running off headlong into a problem is not how this works. But us running after the Lord Jesus and trusting Him through all things and seeking His face as we move closer with Him and walk the path of life, 
and we encounter, ine encounter inevitable suffering, we need to be ready to understand that that suffering is going to have a casualty factor to it. It will cost you something. It will cost you friends or money or comfort or something. It's, this is not a convenient based in patience. This is, this is something that the world could look at you and say, how in the world can she or he bear up under that? The day I, I believe in this teaching because uh, the days of the church being able to go with relatively little suffering uh, are over. They're going to end. If they haven't already ended, they're close to ending. We are socially dislocated. Uh, the, the, a biblical worldview is now becoming a minority worldview in our country. Um, if we are at all going to be affiliated with the spreading of the gospel in difficult territories on the earth, um, how do I put this? I've heard pastors say in a big church, um, a missionary came in and showed, told their story, and it was an authentic story, and then the pastor said, we need to support this missionary financially. And if we don't, I'm going to pray that your sons and daughters are sent. Like, that's a bad thing. That church gave a ton of money to, those, to that missionary. Because we, we, are, we have to leave the mindset that the worst thing that can happen to one of my kids is they go serve the Lord in a foreign country. That should be an honor. Uh, so the, the concept that, that I praise God we're leaving I praise God we're leaving this strange marrying of Western civilization and tons of money and tons of comforts and tons of property with the institution of the church. And you can't tell which one ends and where one ends and where one begins. There's just as much gossip in the church as there is on the streets. I praise God we're leaving this time so that we know, we know that we're Christian. We can, we can see, we can tell the difference of what's going on. And a lot of people are grieving. They miss the America they knew. They miss, they miss the 1950s church. I can't tell you how many times I hear about Dudley Strain. I love the guy. I never met him. But the reason we're excited about Dudley Strain is because he happened to be the pastor of this church in the 1960s. Every church in the 1960s was at its prime. Every, see what I mean? We are, from what Eisenhower did by telling everybody to get in church whether or not you believed, making church a parade, I could go on and on, but the point is, scriptures like these are going to be more relevant, and you may not, I don't, I mean, I hate to judge people's ages, you may not live to see these changes like I'm going to live to see these changes, but it's critical that we cling to and receive and rejoice over truth that we get to suffer for Christ. Not have to. The early church would sing hymns. How do I... The only martyr... The only martyr that actually faced the full weight of his martyrdom was Jesus Christ. And he didn't sing a song. Because he was busy being forsaken by God. He became a curse. He became sin that knew no sin. That we could become the righteousness of God. So Jesus, when Jesus died on the cross, he wasn't singing a hymn of joy. Because for the only martyr, the only martyr, no other one would go through this. He actually experienced the back of God walking away from him. But all the other martyrs from Stephen, Peter, James... John, all the martyrs, including the early Christians in large numbers in the gladiator pits, they were singing hymns of joy because they were getting closer to Jesus Christ. They, could, they, they have these stories of the heavens opening and the saints seeing, like Stephen saw, the Lord standing at the right hand of the Father. And they would rejoice that they were able to suffer for Christ. This is... This is so important to understand that if we can't even exercise inconvenient patience today, 
How in the world do we expect to rejoice in suffering tomorrow? And I, I believe, I believe God is going to prove that the church of Jesus Christ in America is more biblical and more rooted than we ever dreamed. As soon as the comforts leave. I remember interviewing here uh, in 2014 in February. Uh, great time to come to Lubbock. Uh, and I asked if, if First Christian Church lost their facility, would we still have a church? Now, the answer was yes, but it does shock you to ask the question. If you lost, if you lost, if, if I left, would we still have a church? If I left, we lost the facility, all of our elders died, would we still have a church? I mean, that, these are the questions we have to ask because the early church faced these every day. Because at any minute, Paul could be killed. At any minute, Peter would be hung upside down on a cross. Any minute, the, 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 the house church could be discovered and, and taken out. So that's... Can I, can you? Yeah. Yes. Uh, American missionaries came to South Korea. Um, a lot of the mother captured and brutally died. But what they spread, South Korean one, that later years became a Christian nation. And a whole lot more Christian than Buddhists. Ten million Christians in South Korea. Yes, and I'm a recipient of that product. My mother, who is almost close to 90 years old, say even these days America is motherland. Based upon their Christian faith that they delivered to South Korea. Mm -hmm. and I'm a more younger generation received by Gideons, who simply put those Gideons translation both English and Korean, put everywhere, every building. I happen to pick the Gideon, the blue book, simply without knowing who God was, simply I want to study English. English come from America. As it seems like a very naive tactic for my benefit, one that I was introduced, Jesus Christ. Amen. So what you're saying here is it actually this is missionary. Yeah. In a small scale of our mm -hmm. groups here is what an impact. Yes, they died, they suffered but didn't die. Yes, church will, some churches closing down, but still mysterious. God never gave up. Uh, Wasn't it 1907 in Pyongyang, capital of North Korea, when it was one country? Yes. We experienced an amazing revival. Yes. They, called it, they called it the Eastern Pentecost. Yes. And people were convicted of sins. I mean, they, and all these great things happened. And then the communists took over and all, as many as could escape to the southern half of the country um, and continue to spread the gospel. When God, if the American church could wake up and have a desire to be where the action is, and to understand that to this hour there are Egyptians hitting their knees to be beheaded for the faith, um, that we would not spend our money on ourselves. That we would not create programs for ourselves. And it's always about uh, how to improve your marriage or how to... Uh, or this is a sin I've been repenting of. Quit making the point of Christianity about some tingly feeling down your spine to discern the will of God for your life. Yes, God can show and give you signs and open up doors and do all sorts of things. But the devil can do... He can also give feelings. He can also give... And what if one of the greatest mysteries of deception that's occurred in the American church is, is that we've been tingly down our spine to go become this or that vocation or go live in this or that state or go buy this or that house or buy this or that car. Or do, it's all about us consuming something and we've ignored two of the greatest commissions which is number one that the church ought to be the people who are adopting and fostering kids that would be normal for the church not an exception number two is that we are sending our sons and daughters even ourselves into the mission field spending our lives for the gospel whether overseas or in the inner city or places where no one's willing to go places where they need light this is this is the point 
if the tingly feeling down your spine is a substitute for the written will of God, people say, I don't ever, so, say, I, sometimes I don't feel like God's talking to me. <laughs> I'm not denying the Holy Spirit, and I'm not denying His ability to give tingly feelings and to lead us into paths of righteousness. However, the Holy Spirit's greatest joy is that Christ be known to all men that the gospel be preached, that we know these stories, that South Korea is a completely different country because the gospel was sent. And that's, I mean, there, there are, the, right currently, America, the United States of America is the number one country that's sending missionaries out. The second country right behind it is South Korea, which 100 years ago had 1%, practically no Christians, 1%. Oh, all shaman and Buddhism, yeah. you name it. When you think of North Korea, Pyongyang, to imagine that that's where a great revival took place in 190, I think it was 1907. It's amazing that that happened. We could call it Lucifer, struck it to, to scatter, and all that did was produce 10 million Christians, where there was practically no Christianity not long ago. So anyhow, but we'll get back into this. But that's, I, just, I had to say that because suffering, persevering, was a, was a no-brainer in the early church. And, and this is not to scare us, but to recognize that we are all products of the American version of we beat Hitler, let's build big churches, and have a great economy, and have board structures and, and elections and things. We, we are all the product of that, whether you're Baptist, Lutheran, or Disciples of Christ, of a very specific brand of Christianity that doesn't do well with suffering. <clears throat> we're fixers. If we're hot, we turn down the AC. The last thing an American Christian naturally thinks until we're convicted, the last thing we would think about discomfort is that it's God's will for our lives. So, I hate to get off on that sermon. but Alright. Okay, so he says um, in verse... 10, he says, Brothers, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Um, and so I've written, Prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord, they spent their lives to get the word of God out there, out there in the world, and they suffered down their path. He writes, Look, we all consider them blessed, don't we? Don't, when I say Isaiah, what do you think? A blessed man. Uh, Jeremiah. Well, when, when they were going through their ministries, they suffered greatly, and they were considered nuisances. In, hi in hindsight, we call them blessed, but in real time, they were considered negative Nancys. Uh, but we now, no jo I mean, no, not even thinking about it, we'll look back people who have walked the road and persevered through suffering um, as blessed. Persevere is a new word he introduces here that's not the same as patience. Persevere means uh, to remain under the conditions ordained for them. And I've written you know, several prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Micah, Amos, uh, Job. And he brings up Job. Job's only brought up twice in the New Testament here. Um, he's talked about and he says, uh, And you know we consider blessed uh, those who persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. For the Lord is full of compassion and mercy. One of the books of the Bible I'd like us to study. Next study we'll do Revelation. And then I'd like to do Job. Um, when we read Job, we'll see a couple things. Number one is that Job, Job did persevere, and that's what James says. But Job was not always patient. So I, James is not lying here. Job remained under the sovereignty of God, but he wasn't always patient, but he remained. Um, and the, as I've written, the point of the book of Job is, is that it's about a faithful God, not a perfect sinner. Jesus would, be, uh, would later be the better Job. Jesus would be emptied of all of his comforts and all of his glory. And then in the end of the story, he would regain twice as much as he lost. Um, and we see in verse 11, we see that what the Lord finally brought about, the results, 
and we see that the Lord is full of compassion and mercy. And so when we look at, for instance, the life of, the life of Job, the point is that this man woke up by the end of the story and rejoiced and humbled himself at the nearness of God, did he not? Job 42, I had heard about you, but now I see you, and I repent. That's the point. Is your story, my story, is based on the nearness of Christ, not on us being um, self-sufficient, good people, full of patience. So, um, how do I say this? Our our source of patience isn't because we're, we want to be known as a patient person or we want to be considered a good person. Our source is that we can see Christ. Unless you believe, unless you believe Jesus Christ will return on a great and glorious day, you'll wear out. Your patience will be conditional. You'll only do things if you, if you get thanked for it. Or if you see the results. Don't, that is how we say, oh, I give up. I'm discouraged because I don't see the result. Well, did God call you to that person? Well, I didn't think about that. <laughs> if God did call you to that person, there is a result. He doesn't know you seeing it. What we see in the story of Job um, is a story about God who allowed this to happen to this man. He showed up at the end of his life so that people thought great things about God, not great things about Job. And so there's several closing things I wanted to, to add, uh, or I guess based on Job. Number one is do not be patient by focusing on how great and patient of a man or woman you are, but be patient as a fruit of focusing on how good God is and how near Jesus is. Verse 12 says, Above all, do not swear by heaven or earth or anything else. Let your yes be yes, your no be no, or you will be condemned. What he's saying is, swear doesn't mean uh, cussing. It means um, making oaths. And so I've written, don't, when, you're, when you're on a path of obedience, including being patient and suffering, do not go out and make other oaths or shop for a better deal or give up on the crop and think about getting into selling insurance um, or to try to change the game halfway through. Don't you love it uh, for economic people when they change the rules halfway through the game? Um, Job. If you read the, when we read the story and the, the, the message of God through Job, is that he's constantly enticed to reorient his way of thinking. And he starts off, I mean, he starts the book with faith. And he says, The Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And he worshiped him. That's where he started, that's where he ended. In between, there were all these salesmen coming by. Have you considered? And by the end of the story, he's, he's not only saying the same things, but he's saying them with more gusto because he's seeing the God that, he, that he's been worshiping his whole life. And so what we see here is, as you're going through the sufferings for Christ, persevering, make sure that deep into the story, deep into what God's doing in your life, you never forget what happened to you the day you were saved. You never forget the faith you had when you were a little kid. You never, you don't, um, only a fool would graduate from the grace of the gospel. So you don't mess it up, you don't complicate it. And I've written, the story of your life is that you were brought forth by God's will, you were redeemed by God's grace, and you will return, and God will return through His Son, Jesus Christ, for you. God is the story of your life, and we are bit players. So five things as we close. Number one, remain in the tension that your character is now of heaven, and your calling is to remain until Christ returns or God calls you home. Don't retire from your calling. Keep pushing. Keep praying. I, uh, real quick, I, I, I don't know what's going to happen worldwide, and I don't know what's going to happen with our country. Things, do you realize how fast things have changed in the last five years? I was joking with our staff the other day. 
I try to stay out of politics, but just as a social experiment, it was like Joe Biden fell asleep for five years and woke up and he's running for president and everyone hates him of his own party now. It's, it's a, you see how fast that happened? Uh, it, this isn't like a 50 year trickle. This is a, so things are moving fast. Um, one of the things I, I expect and believe God will do through many Americans that are so well uh, financed and comfortable um, is that he's going to call early retirees to tithe their retirement and to consider three years overseas missions. Um, I mean, it sounds crazy, doesn't it? Imagine that happening in our country, that our churches, that I, I have to, I don't want to call out names, I don't want to freak anybody out, but as the pastor, I was like, what are we going to do for three years without so-and-so, you know, because they're over, you know, uh, wouldn't, that, wouldn't that be amazing? Uh, that we remain in that tension between we want to be in heaven, but we're called to be patient, we're called to go reap, and we're called to go invest in people's lives for the sake of the gospel until we're done sucking wind. Or until Christ returns, whichever happens first. Wow. Now I look in this room, I, I know uh, Cal Brents and Dave go over and, and uh, they've worked with the Rotary Club for, to eradicate polio. I know we do these things. The ch we've got good groups, Rotary, we've got all these great groups, but only the church, only the church is the one that's going to be out there translating the, the Bible into unknown languages and getting it to people. I love the Rotary Club, but they're, they're not doing that. We need the other things too. But the, real, the, calling, the calling of the church, the primary calling of the church is that people know that there's a man named Jesus Christ and he's the only way to salvation. And so that's one thing, is that our whole lives we would remain in that tension until it's our turn to rest. We can rest in heaven. Number two is to be patient as a strategy, as we see in farmers. Get to know a farmer. Number three, be strengthened in heart, for Jesus is close and he will return. The more the return of Christ and his nearness can be a fact and less of an idea, the better. Whatever you have to do to remove that from being an abstract thought into a reality, maybe he, you've had your own experiences of the hand of God touching you at the right time, or just an assurance Jesus appears in your bedroom. I mean, if you've had your experience, hold fast to those. Those are, in this room, there are people who have had those legitimate experiences, very intimate, close encounters with the Lord. The more we can believe the fact that Christ is near and the fact that he will return when it's time, the more these things are going to happen naturally in our hearts. Number four is to persevere down the path of obedience, including when we suffer for the faith. And number five, may they say of you, we have seen what the Lord finally brought about. That's what we say of Job. That's what we say of Isaiah. That's what we say of all the prophets of old. May they say of us, whether it's the angels in heaven or it's people remembering us of the final days, may they say, of you, we have seen what God has brought about in their lives. May we not waste our lives. Uh, God's given us a, if we're at a casino, there's a jack, there's a, there's one levered machine. Every time you put a nickel in it, it's a jackpot. His name's Jesus. <laughs> and whether it's you find two quarters on the ground or you take $10,000 and you apply it to that machine, it's always a jackpot. And I'm just asking the church and myself included, I'm preaching to myself because I've never even thought about, you know, these things I'm talking about in a legitimate way. Uh, may we recognize that the biggest regret we'll have at the end of time, if you're saved, if you're not saved, you're going to have a lot of regrets. But if you are saved, the biggest regret we'll have is how little we put into that machine when we were given so much. Let's pray. Father, we, uh, we, see, uh, we see the Bible and we see ourselves and we thank you that you will, um, by your grace, you will um, reconcile the two. The standard set before us, the calling set before us, is something we cannot do of our own strength. But by the Holy Spirit, you can continue to mold our lives and the lives of the church in America to know the difference between being not liked versus suffering for the gospel. 
God, we thank you, Lord, that the Bible promises those who are willing to even lay down our lives for the sake of the Word of God, being willing to receive slander and, and cursing, that we will be counted among the great of the saints. We thank you that this is happening right now, that we can look to examples in the southern and eastern hemispheres where the saints of God are preaching the word of God even to death. We thank you, Lord, that you've given us comforts, but we pray that the money would not win, but the gospel would win, and you would show us how to use our position of privilege to seek and save the lost of the world. We thank you for Jesus Christ, what he's done in our hearts. We thank you for the comfort of the gospel and the convictions of the gospel that we are called, like a farmer, to sow and to wait expectantly with patience and to greet every good work as it's sown and every good work as it's reaped. May the harvest be plentiful, O God, we pray. In the name of Jesus, we ask. Amen. Amen.